Hey, I've got this um, unusual Italian genre film uh, for tonight. Some people say it's a giallo, some people say it's a horror film. It could be considered an art film. I think it's a commercial product um, masquerading as an author movie from uh, director Francesco Barilli, who also made a movie called Pensione Paura, The Perfume of the Lady in Black. Beautiful uh, cover image here, which immediately uh, markets the film really well, sells the movie. Memse Fama is our star, and uh, the movie uh, takes place in Rome, borrows very liberally from uh, Repulsion and Vertigo. It comes from this period when it was easier than today to get started in the film business, at least in Rome, where there was a movie starting shooting every other day, pretty much, throughout the 60s and the early 70s. So uh, Francesco Barilli, who was more of an artist, got a chance uh, to put some financing together to uh, get launched with this uh, feature here. And um, visually, this movie, Perfume of the Lady in Black, is uh, nearly immaculate. It's not the most high-budget film in the world, but uh, it's very carefully composed shots and the color palette is wonderful. The film is a joy to look at. Had cinema been all about just pretty pictures, this film would have been the ultimate masterpiece, probably, or a candidate for the ultimate masterpiece. However, what this, this movie lacks is uh, it doesn't convince you for a second. It, it, it's very happy to stay on the surface and keep you on the surface, but there aren't um, characters who are interesting enough or colorful enough to, uh, you know, carry, carry this uh, story uh, forward. Younger viewers who are just maybe discovering uh, European genre cinema as an alternative to very boring, prefabricated, big-budget um, you know, uh, studio movies, they might say, oh, this is radical, this is some kind of a statement, wow, this is an overlooked gem. Yeah, I mean, I can see myself reacting like that had, had I seen this as a 12-year-old, maybe I would have thought, okay, this is a profound movie or something, because it's, you know, it's a bit different. There is also an interview with the, with the filmmaker, with the director on this Blu-ray here, and he's pretty frank about this film's genesis and how it was, you know, pretty much just a, a way to, uh, you know, get started in the business, make, make a bottle of money and not, you know... He doesn't claim that he's uh, delivered something, um, you know, extraordinary there. And if you look at it that way, if you think, okay, this is a commercial product, but delivered with you know, with a great degree of competence and some artistic flourishes, then it's a it's a movie that succeeds 100%. Mimsa Fama is super photogenic and uh, chic and mode. However, as usual for her, I find she's been in quite a few genre movies typecast as this kind of a fragile uh, victim. And uh, in, in this case here, she's the focal point of the story and uh, I found after about 20 minutes into the film, once we've established where we are and roughly, you know, the film's genre got sort of uh, got established, I was feeling, okay, this, this movie isn't taking off and my frustration kept growing as, as the movie continued. So uh, it can be frustrating if you, if you like to um, explore the story through your protagonist's eyes because the protagonist is it's quite a sexist movie, so as it's a woman, so she basically is a total pushover. It reminded me a little bit of this movie I reviewed earlier on this month, uh, Barbarian Sound Studio, where Toby Jones was this completely, you know, I don't want to say loser, but a person who's got no willpower whatsoever. And it's a similar situation here where, you know, it's Mimsy Farmer, she's good looking. She's apparently got a few subordinates at work. She like works at this great big chemical facility, I don't know, developing some kind of crazy pictures and like there is men and women uh, at her, you know, back and call and yet she's still completely, you know, mm, she's stuck in the kind of cliche woman's role, something from the 50s, you know, where she's completely subjugated to anyone, 
you know, when she says, I don't want to do something, and then the other character s says, no, you're still going to do it. She just nods and says, okay, that's fine. And that includes a very rapey sex scene. So she has this quite boring uh, boyfriend played by uh, Mauricio Bonuglia. And apparently, according to the director, this boyfriend got inserted into the movie just because the producers, the financiers, uh, the, fi uh, the, the finance behind the film insisted. So that, that was already like some alarm bells. So there is quite a bit of sort of sexual, non-consensual sex overtones in this movie, in the, even though it's very stylish and I loved watching 1970s Rome and the exterior shots. I loved the carefully uh, designed interiors. It's got plenty of visual artistic merits. I just found it's very upsetting how it's just such a sexist and kind of also racist movie, so, you know. I don't know. The, the score is by Nicola Piovani and I found the main theme kind of lethargic and I found that it, it just kind of slowed things down. This, I have this general feeling with this movie. It shows its age, not just through some very dated attitudes, race and gender attitudes, it's more like through this um, distended kind of pacing where tons and tons of screen time are allowed to just, you know, pass by without really any suspense or anything like that. You know, there are directors like Antonioni who do that on purpose and are lauded for that and are considered great masters of that sort of, you know, uh, spaced out art of cinematic storytelling. Whereas here, what we have here is a <laughs> just kind of frustration where you want things to make a bit more sense or what you want things to maybe chug along a little bit faster and they don't so i think you have to be in the mood for this movie to enjoy it i definitely think it's worth a look if you are interested in cinematic techniques because it's a great example of a mid-range genre movie from the time with gorgeous visuals some very interesting interior design and sets some interesting um, supporting cast but the general story arc was very very uh, flabby and uh, it didn't really hold my attention it's not a thriller it's not a murder mystery it's hardly a horror film so you know but uh, apparently the film you know they managed to sell the movie so it didn't completely go under too badly so watch it for beautiful views of early 1970s Rome in the summer, some great period outfits, an occasional stylish bit here and there. But don't expect a movie which plays by today's uh, rules in terms of being, you know, <laughs> inclusive or being, uh, you know, racially sensitive or any of that, because it's a product of its time. And I think it's, uh, I mean, I think it's kind of offensive as well. So. Uh, so, so yesterday I reviewed Cronenberg's um, Dead Ringers, which was very well acted and was definitely an artistic, a movie of artistic merit. And so it, it's a tough one to follow up. And obviously Barilli's movie isn't of the same uh, level, but it's not such a massive drop. At least this movie still has a very distinct visual look and while the story is not the strongest, at least the, the film's visual uh, visual uh, achievement is undeniable. And y you may forget the film, but you, you'll, you'll probably remember some key shots, some key images. And that's not bad for such a commercial uh, product, I'd say. So that was uh, 31 Days of Horror. Thanks for watching.